Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on uh, my radio stations. This is a radio show that uh, is syndicated by the Premier Radio Network. So heard it on about, I don't know, 160, 170 stations around the country, including XM Channel 166, every weekday, Saturday and Sunday from 2 to 5 Eastern Time. Uh, this is episode 826. We recorded this uh, November 27, 2011. Hope you enjoy it. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Ford, featuring available sync with my Ford Touch. Sync with my Ford Touch gets you to your destination with integrated turn-by-turn -turn directions and directional arrows displayed on little screens right behind your steering wheel so you never have to take your eyes off the road. Check it out in the new 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by the Epson Workforce Pro, the world's fastest two-sided printer, delivering high-speed two-sided color printing, copying, scanning, and faxing to keep your business running at full speed. Plus, you'll save on ink. Check out the Epson Workforce Pro this holiday season at Epson.com. Well, a good day to you. Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. And it's time to talk about, yeah, tech. Oh, it's a good time to do it, I'll tell you. As we enter the holiday season, 8888-ASK-LEO is the number, 888-827-5536, toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. Outside the U.S., you could call that number using Skype, and it'll be still toll-free. 8888-ASK-LEO, your questions about tech are welcome, and it can be computers, the Internet, but it can also be cell phones. I just ordered at huge expense. This is how much I care about you. I, I buy these things so you don't have to. <laughs> I read the manuals so you don't have to. Uh, you know, I kind of I been into this stuff. But the idea being that by, you know, buying a Kindle Fire and a Nook tablet, by buying every, you know, important phone, I can give you a, a, a hands-on, educated opinion about the quality uh, and, and the merits of these devices. And, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of tech journalists uh, just, just call the company and say, hey, can you give me one or can you lend me one? Usually it's, it's, it's can you lend me one. Uh, in most cases, uh, well, for instance, we bought a, a Nook tablet, a 250-buck uh, tablet. I, you know, I didn't want to, but I bit the bullet. I thought, I gotta, you know, if I'm going to talk about the Fire, I, which I did also buy, I have to buy the tablet. I didn't need it. I got the Fire, but I have to have both. And uh, after I bought it, Barnes & Noble said, well, you would like a loaner? <laughs> it's like, well... <laughs> Yeah, but I'm gonna send it right back. I I, I did I did accept the loaner so that others uh, on my staff can try it while I'm trying it. Um, but and of course you send it back after a week or two. Um, but that's why almost why I buy it. a couple of reasons I buy this stuff for the most part. Uh, one is uh, uh, and this is always a problem with um, specialty media. You know, it happens in Washington uh, political coverage. It the inside the Beltway guys and gals when you um, it's very difficult when you cover one thing, not to become buddy buddy with your subjects. In the case of the Beltway media, with with politicians, and the problem is, it's hard to be very straightforward and honest when you're friends with somebody. It's especially hard to be critical when you're friends with somebody. And it's a it's a problem in the tech industry too, and uh, any you know the cars, everything. When you're when you're covering a single beat, it, the, the tendency is to get to know the people that you're covering, and that's death. Because then you're really hesitant to say, well, this thing's terrible. So I really like to keep these people at arm's length. I don't take vendor meetings. You, know, you won't hear on this show, you will never hear uh, anything but journalists. You don't hear people selling products or people who represent companies on here for that reason. Uh, it's, it becomes an ad, and I don't want to get to know them, and I want to keep them at arm's length. I want to be like... The rest of us. I want to be a user who buys the stuff because you got to feel that pain, right? I hear a lot of tech pundits saying, oh, you know, the iPad is definitely better than the Kindle. But that's because they didn't pay $500 for the iPad and versus $200 for the Kindle. You ha that's part of the equation. You have to weigh that in. And when it's coming out of your own pocket, you definitely pay attention to those things. Of course you do. So we have a, I have a budget. 
a certain amount of money I spend every month on technology. Anyway, this all started because I said, uh, we're talking about phones. And the hot phones right now, iPhone obviously 4S, you know, it's fairly dominant. And then uh, of, there are a variety of Android phones to compete with it. And then there's the Windows phone. And, I, and Microsoft did send me, I have to admit, I did not buy this. Uh, Microsoft, uh, ac their public relations firm, Wagner Edstrom, sent me the, uh, I guess this is the Samsung Windows phone from AT&T. They call it the Focus S. It's the, the Focus was the original one. It's the Galaxy. I'm not sure what they call it. See, I didn't buy it. I don't know. That's, you know, it bugs me a little bit, but they, they insisted. So, that, but I think this is an impressive phone. I like this. So that's one choice. I have a Galaxy 2S on Sprint that I paid for. But, but everybody's excited about and interested in the, the Galaxy Nexus, which is the phone Google announced a few weeks ago. They haven't said anything about availability. The guess, the best guess is December 8th on Verizon, but nobody really knows. Somebody, I found somebody online, Expansis, I think they're called, that's selling an unlocked GSM version, probably the European version, for 750 bucks. Ow. I talk about feeling the pain. But I ordered that today. So I, uh, will ha I have an account with all of the uh, major uh, phone companies. Again, paid account so that I have a sense of what it's like to be a real customer. Uh, and so I'm going to trade in. I'm going to take the SIM out of this Lex, uh, LG G2X, which was the first uh, dual-core phone I had. And I'll put that in the Nexus, the Galaxy Nexus, and I'll give you a report next week at this time on on that phone. Because that people are talking about that. There's a, a couple of reasons that there's some real interest there. Uh, first of all, it, it's the first uh, phone to have a, a, a 720p display. It's a very high-res phone, big screen, too. But mostly people are interested in the operating system. It's the latest, for, you know how geeks are, oh, it's the latest, the latest version of Android called Ice Cream Sandwich. And this is what Google really is putting its money behind. They believe this is the kind of the merging of the tablet operating system, Honeycomb, with the latest version for the phone, Gingerbread, into one des giant dessert topping called Ice Cream Sandwich that will be going forward the operating system for all Android products, they hope. So we got to see it. This is the only phone running it. Don't know when it'll be out. They haven't said. They only have said that it would be Verizon in the U.S. So I was able to get, I'll order that, and I'll have it by next week, and I'll have had some time to. Um... The Resound is 720p. All right, well, what is the resolution? I have to, I have to look now. The, the, the HTC Resound does look like a very, very nice phone. Uh, but the Resound is running, you know, Gingerbread, the older version of uh, the Android operating system. So really, besides the hardware, the most interesting thing about all of this is the uh, is going to be the operating system. Anyway, I'll have a look at that for you. And uh, as uh, as uh, Tech 2011 is saying in our chat room, this is really true. You you, you kind of blanch at the cost of some of these phones, even if it's two hundred bucks, but which is the subsidized cost, but really it's the monthly fee that's going to get you. It's 100 bucks, 80 bucks, 100 bucks a month for a smartphone times, the you know, they guarantee you have to have it 24 months. We're talking 2,000 bucks, so forget the, uh, forget the list price. That's just a, a fraction, less than half of the total cost of these phones. 8888 Ashley, if you want to talk about phones, we can also talk about home theater. Scott Wilkinson will be joining us in about uh, 20 minutes. In fact, exactly 20 minutes, 33 after the hour, to uh, talk about home theater. He's always good on that. Uh, also, Chris Marquardt, our digital camera guy, our photo guy, has his reviews of our camera uh, submissions. I hope you submitted some, some shots of the screen. So we'll talk about uh, that as well. 8888 Ask Leo. And of course, I know a few of you bought hard, hardware and software over the uh, Black Friday, over the uh, weekend too. Some amazing deals on HDTVs. If you'd like a little hand holding in that regard, we can do that too. Help you get those things set up. Scott's going to be here, so your home theater questions would be great right about now. 8888 uh, Ask Leo. Scott's going to be filling in for me. I think, Scott, is it December 11th? I think it's December 11th. I'm going to um, Paris for a uh, conference that I, I've done. This is the second year, and it's really a fun conference called Le Web. It's, 
<laughs> it's a bunch of European entrepreneurs and then the organizer, Loic Lemur, who is himself a Frenchman living in the U.S. and a, a serial entrepreneur. Seismic is his company. He brings American entrepreneurs to Paris to meet with European entrepreneurs for a meeting of minds. It's an amazing conference. We'll actually be covering that, but because of the time uh, change... It'll be have to it won't be on this show. It'll have to be on uh, my podcast network because uh, they are nine hours ahead of us. So we're going to start at one in the afternoon, which is uh, what is that? Six a.m. Pacific time, nine a.m. Uh, Eastern. But you can watch that twit.tv. That'll be December. Uh, I think what is it? Now I have to I think fifth, sixth, seventh. Yeah. On twit.tv. 8888-ASK. Leo, let's get to the phones. Your call's next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So, here's the deal. Uh, Ford, and we've talked about the Ford Sync. I, I, I know by now you must know. This is for Jack, who's just started listening to the show for the first time. Uh, Jack, I drive a Mustang. 2010 Mustang. Got it a couple of years ago. I love it. And what I really love is Ford Sync. And now they've got sync with my Ford Touch, which is even more. You've got a big screen in the middle, big, like uh, seven or eight inches. And then you have two screens behind the steering wheel. And I'm always talking about the fact that you can talk to the car, say, play a song, set the temperature, where's the gas station, all that stuff. I mean, it really is great. You press a button. There's a button right on the steering wheel, right where your thumb is at 10 and 2, right? Boom. And it, and it either talks to you or I have it set for a... I don't need the voice prompts because I've been using it so long. So I just let it beep at me. It goes boom. And you talk to it. And then, you know, you're driving, you're keeping your eyes on the road, your hands on the wheel, you're driving along, boom. And you, and you tell it what song you want to play. If you have uh, the app link, the new app link, you can have Pandora, Stitcher. You can even have it read tweets to you. On some phones, it reads text messages to you. That's always a barrel of laughs. <laughs> but here's the thing. I never, I never, I never uh, talk about the GPS. This is the best GPS I've ever used. It's so fantastic. And now they've got all these new features. If you go to Ford.com slash technology, you can find out about this. Ford.com slash technology. Um, they've got uh, a web interface so that you can, for instance, be on your computer and send uh, text messages over, or not text messages, uh, you can be on MapQuest or Google Maps and send the location that you want to go to to your, the, your web interface, which will then send it to your car. So you know, as you go, you can set, and uh, you can have text messages go to your um, uh, phone about traffic conditions. I mean, it goes both ways. Forty million businesses in its database, including directions and phone numbers. So you just say the name of a business; it'll not only nav you there, you can call ahead. It's 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 easily the best out there. I want you to give it a try. Ford dot com slash technology to take a look or go get that 2012 Ford Focus. It is awesomeness. Ford dot com slash technology. And we thank them so much for their support of the uh, Tech Guy podcast. What is that? Wrong. She got a leg up high on the bump of my big black man. I have no idea what this is and I don't know if I want to know. Our musical director, Kyle Benham, once again. <laughs> Chrome. I get it. Chrome. He's talking about Chrome, the Google uh, browser, Chrome, uh, and operating system, too, Chrome OS. Uh, I, uh, uh, you know, this show is all over the country, 170 stations, uh, all over the U.S., XM Satellite, Channel 166. We do podcasts that are heard around the world. So I have a very global audience, but I wanted to do something a little bit local uh, for folks who are listening on uh, one of our stations in San Francisco on KGO. Because it's a good cause. It's for music in the uh, schools today. Must. And it's a fundraiser for music in the schools today. And the reason I think it's kind of interesting is it's called Silicon Valley Rocks. It's their fourth annual event. And they have a bunch of bands. <laughs> uh, they have a bunch of bands that um, are mostly entrepreneurs and tech folks. <laughs> which I love. It's amazing how many musicians there are in the tech community. People like Paul Allen, the uh, the founder of Microsoft, what is fifth richest man in the world, something like that. He has a uh, he built a boat, kind of one of the largest boats in the world. A boat's not even right. He built a cruise ship, and in the in the hold of the cruise ship is a music studio with an engineer in there full time so that Paul, anytime he wants to go down and play his guitar can rock out. He's got a recording studio on his boat. He built the uh, the uh, music, what is it called? The, the um, 
something music experience in uh, Seattle, originally a Jimi Hendrix museum, has now become the, uh, a museum of all rock and roll. A lot of, uh, a lot of famous and uh, infamous people are, uh, are um, musicians. So if you want to know more about this event, it's coming up Thursday, December 1st, svrocks.com. It'll be in San Francisco. Um, and you can see there the, the bands from companies like Twilio, Say Media, Google, Mashery, Facebook, Dropbox, Blippi, <laughs> GigaOM, Walden Venture Capital, Adobe, <laughs> Songbird. They just It's so great. It's all these geeks. And, you know, some of them are actually pretty good. I'll say they're all pretty good. You might want to might want to check this out. If you're in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, you can get tickets at svrocks.com. It's a good cause, must, and it's a chance to see um, some some geeks <laughs> in in an unusual way. They also have an auction at Sonos uh, and uh, Bananas at Large and Penfolds uh, have donated uh, stuff for the uh, auction. So there'll be some there'll be some great stuff to get there. Svrocks.com. I just want to give them a little plug. Good cause, and it's just fun to see geeks. Let their hair down. It's longer than you think. Glenn in Canoga Park. You're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Glenn. Um, I've got a desktop that squeals briefly, then shuts down. Black screen. <laughs> that's no squeal. That's a scream of pain. Ah! So it squeals, and then it shuts down. Now, I went uh, and did your, uh, at uh, September 17th, you told somebody how to get to the, uh, uh, the event management. Yes, when you reboot, uh, you can hold you can hold the shift key down and the F8 key down and get into the event manager. And what that shows you is step by step the boot process. And the last thing you see, that's the thing that killed it. Although I think the squeal is probably a hardware issue. But what was the last thing that booted up? Well, uh, this is something that's not happening when I'm booting. This is when it's when it's just sailing along. It's been on for a while. Oh, and then she'll go. <laughs> And boom. Yeah, and I mean, I've got sources, kernel power. This is the um, the critical. Um, I'm almost certain that it's the uh, power supply. Ah, because nothing else could shut it off that fast. Well, if the power supply fails, <laughs> it's like unplugging the computer. It goes. Oh, so you go when you hear that squeal, it just goes dead. Right, and yet I can turn it right back on again, so it's not a bearing apparently. Um. Well, it could be overheating because, believe it or not, it cools off very quickly. I mean, within seconds. So it could be if you had a bad fan or a, a fan, like for instance, here's here's a scenario. There's many things this could be. Here's a scenario. Let's. There's a fan on your CPU, on your microprocessor. In most cases, if that fan is having problems, for instance, maybe it's hitting a cable, and that's what you're hearing, and stops. The CPU will overheat almost instantly. It'll shut itself down. Uh, you turn it back on. The CPU is fine again. Because it cools off within seconds. Would there be any way for that to squeal? Uh, well, the fan could squeal. Uh, uh, what does this squeal sound like? Um, Come on. It's kind of a high pitch. Ah. It only lasts about that long. Yeah, that sounds like a fan hitting something. Ah. So, you, is it a, a laptop or desktop? Desktop. Good. I would open it up and look inside. And uh, first of all, how old is it? About a year, year and yeah, a quarter. It might be pretty dusty in there. You might want to mm, get some d dust out of there. I would look at the CPU fan. You know where the CPU is? It's on the motherboard, which will, if it's a tower case, will be horizontal. Yeah. I'm sorry, vertical, not horizontal. I always confuse those two. I must have missed that day in, in, sixth, in sixth grade. It's, it's vertical, and the, the fan will be on there pointing, you know, left or right. And look at it. Make sure there's no wires anywhere near it. Um, turn it on and leave it while it's open. Don't put your finger in there while it's open, but you, you can safely turn it on while it's open. And look at everything moving. Make sure nothing's hitting anything. And if it isn't, it's uh, my, my, my best guess is it's actually, uh, that squeal is actually coming from the power supply. It, and that's an easy, fortunately, an easy and cheap thing to fix. So it could be bearings on a fan. It could be a fan hitting something. I, you know, without hearing it, it's hard to tell. If you if you take it to a, a geek, the problem is you have to use it for a while before it happens. Oh yeah. Yeah. For for hours. Yes. 
So it doesn't sound like that is something hitting something because it would be hitting it from the beginning. So it sounds like it's either overheating or a power supply that gets hotter and hotter and finally goes, ah! And it's been happening more often recently. Yeah. So I, can, I can see the progression because there are about, uh, about eight of them um, that apparently happened in the last, uh, well, from January. Oh, your event viewer tells you, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds, uh, sounds like there is some mechanical thing, not software, but a mechanical thing. It's either a CPU fan failing. You know, if it... If it for instance, if the bearings are bad on the fan, but not really bad, it'll work, 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 it gets hotter, 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 then it goes, oh, and freezes up or makes a noise. That could be going. Could be a capacitor. When you open it up, look for any uh, electro look for electrolytics spewed onto the motherboard. But I think the fact that it's happening over and over again um, means that it's an overheating thing that's happening when you, when you uh, use it for a certain period of time and then it overheats. And I think because of that, I would look at the power supply and look at the fans. Those, to me, would be the most likely possibilities. You could put your hand, don't, again, don't put your hand in the thing, but uh, when the fan on the power supply blows out the back, you can put your hand there and you'll be able to feel a, a light little breeze coming out. If, it's, if it stops, that's it. Um, I, I think it's most likely something overheating and probably replaceable easily. Fans are cheap. The power supply is cheap. Just going to take a little uh, digging in there. These, you know, it, computers are nowadays sold just like phones are with no user serviceable parts inside. In fact, more and more phones are sold without even being able to open them to put a battery in. And uh, I think the idea is that these are disposable. Squealing? No problem. Buy a new computer? I hate to do that. That seems like such a waste. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. There we go. I was saying um, that uh, I've been an Epson fan for a long time. I. I uh, uh, Always thought that the best photo, special, you know, high-end photo printers for photographers are these great Epson printers. Oh, what is it? The R4800, I think I have. It's the 14 by 19 wide carriage. You know, it has all these cartridges, you know, eight color cartridges. It's beautiful. It's the only printer that does decent monochrome. And, and if, you, if you go to LuminousLandscape.com, you'll see that that's what they say as well. I mean, it's just really gorgeous. So I was an Epson fan. I love the Perfection scanners. I recommend. You've heard me recommend them. Um, but one thing I don't like about inkjet printers, and the reason I bought an Epson Color Laser for a Twit when I bought the uh, the office printer originally, uh, was a it was a laser, and because of consumable costs, right? And Epson has been listening. They've released this new line, the Workfo Workforce Pro printers, uh, and the whole deal with these is very economical inkjets. There are reasons you want an inkjet faster, much faster. Uh, this thing is incredibly fast. Double-sided printing, too. It's hard to do that on a laser. This inkjet does double-sided, which does save you money, too, on paper, if you think about it. And it looks really professional. This is an all-in-one, the Workforce Pro, so it does fax, scanning, copying, and printing. Uh, they do a really, really great job of it. Let me pull up the uh, website here. Um, I have the, 40, uh, the 4530. Um, well, in fact... It's funny because I bought one uh, for a twit, and uh, and then now I have one. Oh, listen, my I'm house. talking about it. I, can tell I got you, one for my house, and I can tell you, I love it. It is so awesome, and it has big ink cartridges that last a really long time. 580 page feeder, so it holds more than a ream of paper. So I spent a lot less time dealing with this thing, and it looks fantastic. The ink is 50 percent cheaper. They've really done a good job of keeping costs down. So I'm going to suggest that for this holiday season, you put on your shopping list this Epson Workforce Pro. Give your give your business a little lift. Your, your business deserves a great printer, and it is fantastic. High-speed, automatic, two-sided color printing, copying, scanning, faxing, extra capacity, ink cartridges, 50% less per page versus color laser, which is already very economical. And it looks great, the... Uh, the business graphics and stuff, the printouts are fantastic. I want you to I want you to take a look at the built to perform Epson Workforce Pro. It is a great printer. And give it do your do your office a favor. Give them a gift. Give them a gift of the Epson Workforce Pro. This is the one we bought, and I bought another one at home. <laughs> Love it. Very happy with it. Very fast. They just make great stuff. I had an artisan for a long time. I replaced the artisan with a workforce. Um, there's the 320, which is uh, affordable. Get the Pro, though. You know, you want the Pro. That's got the double-sided and all of that stuff. 
I'm really a, a fan of the, the uh, 4530. Extra large ink, uh, 2,400 pages of black. 2,400 pages per cartridge. That's what makes it so economical. Because you get a lot of pages for that ink. Yeah, yeah, you know, sometimes you get a little inexpensive printer, and it's, you know, the, you spend it all back on the, uh, on the uh, consumables. This is why I really like this one. Really nice printer. Its list is 300, but uh, I'm pretty sure they have, if you shop around at Amazon, you can get it for at least 30% less. 2,400 pages per cartridge for the black. Isn't that amazing? I haven't changed, I, you know, a lot of times you get the printer and the cart the original cartridge just has a little bit of ink, so you'll buy it. No, I haven't changed, I have been running it for a month, I haven't changed the cartridge. And we print a lot at home. Jennifer wants everything. Oh, I didn't even mention iOS printing. So she uses an iPad. She said, can I print? And I used to say, well, not really. Now, you, on the iOS, it's so awesome. There's a print command, and it sees the workforce on the Wi-Fi. It's a Wi-Fi uh, or Ethernet, as well as, you know, the other connections. Enough. Morning, yeah, your Barbie may be like Alan, please. What I gotta do to get it so you have a need to use these. Baby, I'm a smooth as Crisco. This is one of the bands that's gonna be performing at that uh, event I mentioned in uh, San Francisco on Thursday, Silicon Valley Rocks. It's called Alan Mask, and they're all from Google. <laughs> Actually, they all is him. <laughs> he's he's from Google. A hip hop artist who works at Google. I love it. So that's one of the one of the one of the uh, groups that you'll be able to see. Alan Mask, isn't that fun? All to benefit uh, uh, music in the schools. That's cool. SVRocks.com. Hey, it's Scott Wilkinson, our home theater guru. Scott, of course, is the online editor for Home Theater Magazine at HomeTheater.com, and joins us every week to talk about home theater. In this case, he's going to give us a movie review. That's right. Is hey, this, Leo. Hey, Scott. Welcome. Thank you. Scott will be uh, on the, what, I'm not sure which day or if both days, the December 10th, 11th weekend. I'm yep. not sure if you'll be on Saturday or Sunday. We're trying to figure it out. I'm going to be, as I mentioned, in Paris uh, for Le Web. Dog. Le Web. You know, December in Paris, it ain't April. <laughs> it's last it's probably pretty cool. Last year was icy cold. I've been there uh, oh. two Decembers in a row, and it was oh, yeah. freezing. But that's okay. It's Paris. Paris is cool. And the Le Web Conference is really fun. So thank you for doing that. Oh, um, my we're trying to figure out the schedule because I'm also going to be missing uh, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and New Year's Eve. No, New Year's Day. I'll be here New Year's Eve. Uh -huh. So we'll have to figure all of that out, and I'll need other fill-in too. But you're going to hear a lot of Scott in December. Let me put it that way. <laughs> if you've you got home theater questions, this is the guy. This is, and this is the month to do it. I guess it is. You know, Black Friday. I, you, you talked about it last week, um, and it was a, it was a big story uh, because all of the retailers and the heart and the high def television makers had been struggling so hard all year. It's been yeah. such a bad economy. And then I think there's also the thought that. Uh, um, frankly, they've hit saturation. Everybody who wanted an HD TV by now has one. Well, I think that's true to a certain extent, um, although uh, in the chat room there's still people saying, uh, you know, what, what, what should I which buy? TV should I get? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, even if they have one, uh, they might want to upgrade uh, to one that has online apps, to one that has 3D. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I didn't mean that was an involuntary gag. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, I have to say. Um, How many 3D movies did you watch this week? Well, actually, I went and I saw one. Uh, in fact, it's set in Paris. Oh. Uh, it's this movie, this new Scorsese movie called Hugo. And uh, it's, uh, it's in 3D. It's live action 3D. And some of the 3D was stunning. Absolutely amazing. And yet others, other shots were not that great. They were like the actor was in front of a set almost. Yeah. Uh, which which was kind of odd, but it's a fascinating movie. The movie itself is wonderful. I highly recommend it. It's basically about the filmmaker Georges Méliès, who oh yeah was, we, yeah he, he like in the, the turn of the century he's one of the earliest. He's the guy exactly. who did a trip to the moon. Exactly. It's very famous image of the rocket hitting the man in the moon in the, the eye. Man in the moon in the eye. Yeah. Exactly yeah. right. Well, this is the story of that 
filmmaker, yeah. um, somewhat fictionalized. I, I don't know whether the main character, the title character Hugo, a little boy who winds the clocks in the Paris train station, lives oh, wow. in the walls of the Paris train station. So it's kind um, of a fantasy film a little bit. It's it kind like. of a fantasy film, but it's yeah. based upon a real character. Uh, this uh, Georges Méliès and and the movies that he made and it's it's a wonderful movie. It's a little long. It feels a little padded. I would have cut maybe fifteen twenty minutes out of it, and I could certainly do without Sasha Baron Cohen as the <laughs> <laughs> Borat. Yes, yes, he plays the uh, inspector, uh, the sort of the policeman of the train station. Oh dear! And this he's sounds the comic like a horrible relief. movie. To be honest no, 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 with no, you, no, 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 absolutely not, absolutely not. Well, you had three D Borat. I don't know. It was he wasn't Borat though. Is he it was, a kids uh, movie? Is it a grown up movie? I found it to be very compelling myself. Uh, there were some kids in the audience. It's certainly nothing. It's not inappropriate you know, for kids. It's would not kids inappropriate. Would kids enjoy it? I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. The two main characters are Hugo, uh, uh, I don't know, a ten-year-old boy or something, and uh, a twelve-year-old girl who's the granddaughter of Georges Méliès, uh, and they sort of uncover the secret because uh, Georges Méliès made like 500 movies early in his career and then World War I happened and everybody forgot about him and they, they didn't like his movies anymore and he went into total obscurity yeah uh, and then only at the end of his life did was he sort of rediscovered and this is the sto that story and uh, I find it I found it very compelling and well worth the time and as I said some of the 3d shots especially at the beginning there's this long tracking shot following the character Hugo through the little the catacombs in the walls of the Paris train station and it's this long unbroken shot uh, which is remarkable in and of itself in but 3D. then there's also the 3D was yeah. very effective very effective in in that particular uh, in that particular shot so um, it's it, I recommend it highly I, I think it's a wonderful. Well, it's interesting film. that Martin Scorsese is using 3D. I find I find that intriguing. I mean, here's mm -hmm. a guy who is considered by everybody a serious filmmaker. Exactly. Um, uh, and uh, for him to uh, embrace 3D technology, I mean, it was one thing for James Cameron. I understand James Cameron really sure. he makes uh, popular movies that are spectacles. But uh, Scorsese is uh, you know considered by many to be the director's director, and uh, for him yeah. to embrace 3D either means he completely sold out. <laughs> or, in fact, there's some merit uh, to 3D. I, I think, in his case, there is some merit to 3D. Okay. Absolutely. I will, I will um, give it a chance. Give it a shot. And, you know, I shouldn't diss Sasha Baron Cohen because, actually, I think he's brilliant. Um, but uh, and a great actor, and I and, and I've always enjoyed his movies. Although Borat was so over the top. Oh, I, I have I have <laughs> and so. The, and the one after that was just too much. I couldn't take. But uh, Bruno, 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 or whatever. <laughs> so now with Hugo and Bruno and Borat, I'm thinking is I hope this isn't you know. Well, fortunately, this wasn't a vehicle for him. Good. He was a secondary character. Yeah. I mean, he was important in the plot and everything. But, so this is uh, a Christmas movie, yes, or a holiday movie. Uh, well, it's certainly set in the winter time. <laughs> in Paris <laughs> in the winter. So, well, you know, I should probably see it before I go. Yeah, you probably should. Yeah, you probably should. It's set in Paris in the 30s, I believe. Now, and, let me uh, ask you how many 3D movies you've watched at home lately. Oh, uh, well, actually, now, see, I don't you're have the wrong a 3D. guy. Yeah, the wrong I don't guy. have a 3D display at home, right. but at the studio where I do, you do it for my work. TV reviews, I do it for work. Yeah. And I have to say that I still enjoy 3D when it's well done. And I have to always make that caveat because there's some really bad 3D. Yeah. You know, it's it can be done well or it can be done really poorly. Yeah. And when it's done poorly, I hate it as much as the next guy. And there are a lot of haters out there. Um Interestingly, I just did a poll question on my website. Um, do you prefer passive glasses or active glasses 3D flat panels? Because there are now three companies, uh, LG, Toshiba, and Vizio, that are making 3D flat panels that use passive glasses, the right. same type that are used in the movie theaters. Much lighter, much cheaper. Um, but there are some other issues with passive 3D as opposed to active 3D where the glasses blink alternately on and off. Um, and I got, and I gave them three options on this poll question, which was, I like passive better, I like active better, or I hate 3D and I don't care. And I got almost exactly 
evenly distributed responses on all three of those. It was about a third each, which I found very interesting. But I know there are a lot of 3D haters out there. Uh, you're not a real fan of 3D. I know that. <laughs> hate, hate would be such a weak word compared to how I feel. <laughs> I just I feel like it's a gimmick foisted upon us uh, by Hollywood initially because they thought, oh, here's a way to get people in the theaters yeah. because they don't have it at home. And, uh, but and then, I, the, but the HDTV makers got the last laugh because then they're foisting it on people in their homes. See, I'm not sure I buy that argument because 3D TV came out at about the same time. I know. Well, it takes a while. I don't know. Scott yeah. Wilkinson, read it. <laughs> Hometheater.com. And thank you, Scott. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Back to the phones right after this. Scott Wilkinson uh, does a uh, podcast for us, which I did not mention, called Home Theater Geeks. If you're into a home theater, this is like an hour and a half every week of hardcore home theater. In fact, this week it's going to be interesting. He's talking about computer sound, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So if you're interested in getting the best sound out of your computer, and since a lot of us listen to music on our computers more than anywhere else, this is probably for you. Tomorrow, Monday, this uh, November 28th, 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern, on twit, T-W-I-T, dot TV. That's the podcast network. But, you know, that's just the live stream. You can also watch or, uh, or listen because we make audio and uh, video available for download after the fact at, at your convenience. And you'll find that at twit.tv also. Home Theater Geeks is the name of the uh, show. This guy does a great job with that. Sasha Baron Cohen is a funny guy, very good actor. I, I, I think he'll, I'm looking forward to seeing him in Hugo as long as he doesn't play the character Borat. Which was funny the first time. I thought Borat was very funny the first time. Bruno, not so funny. Franny, Southern New Jersey. Hi, Franny. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hell, oh, wait a minute. I gotta, I have, I'm having an issue with my laptop. Windows decided yeah, to... I know about computers, and if you didn't teach me, you taught me where to find the answers. Oh, bless you, Franny. Thank you. Um, I, I, I never had to do this before. I've listened to you talk about it, but I don't remember what you had to say about it. I have 50, 60-year-old 8-millimeter film. Not, not Super 8, 8-millimeter. Eight yeah, so it's and film. It's, the, it's something you put in a projector to watch. Exactly. Got it. I'd like, obviously, to digitize that, but I've been, I heard you talk about a company in California, but I'm from New Jersey. I am so reluctant to mail it. But fortunately, don't yell at me for this, but there was a Groupon deal for this and and it turned out that that it's from new jersey so and i didn't do anything yet i took some pictures and they scanned it they did a pretty good job but i don't understand what format i want because they offer two things they offer dvds and then then they can put it on a hard drive great so question I'm great question so you're not asking how to do it you're asking what format you want it in exactly yeah so uh let's talk a little bit about the whole process in order to get film physical film into a computer, you basically, in some form or fashion, have to take a digital picture of it. So there's two ways that are commonly used for 8 millimeter film or even Super 8 or whatever. You, one way is kind of primitive. You project it and then shoot video of the projection, shoot digital video of the projection. People make boxes to do this. You could do it at home. You don't get a great result. The best way to do it is the most expensive, which is to scan each individual frame of the film, just as you would scan negatives. And then you get, a, and this is when they do HD restores. I just saw the um, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, you know, the Burl Ives TV show. And yeah. it was in HD. And I thought, well, wow. how, how could that be in HD? You can get Star Trek, the original Star Trek, in HD. Well, it's because these shows were shot on film. And so the process of converting them to HD is the same. It's time-consuming and expensive. You scan each frame. There is enough image in that film frame for an HD picture. It's very high quality, but it takes time, and it's very expensive. Um, so, yes, there are companies that do this. I don't know, depending on, uh, you know, how much you paid, what this company did. But now they're offering you a choice. Do you want it on a DVD, or do you want it on a hard drive? If you get it on a DVD, you're going to get the video in something called MPEG-2. Both of these are digital. Both of them can be stored on a hard drive because you know you could take a DVD, rip it, convert it to a hard drive, you know, just like any commercial DVD, and then you have a hard drive copy. So you'll, you can get it on the hard drive both ways. It's really a question of what the quality is of the product they're going to give you. 
the, on the DVD, I can tell you what it is. It's MPEG-2. That's the format for DVD. It is not high def. It's 480p, which is probably fine for this 8 millimeter film. And uh, okay. it's certainly convenient. And you can then put it in your computer and rip it to the hard drive. What I don't know, and so I can't tell you, is what quality they do on the hard drive. They may just do the same files, the MPEG-2 files on the hard drive, in which case there's no difference. What they explained to me is that, that they allowed me to... Uh, I didn't get it done yet, but they, I've talked to them. I've been over there a couple of times. They, they allow me to purchase one, on a sale the actual terabyte hard drive, and I can give it to them. But they require that they... It's it's a double price. They, they're charging me for the DVD, and then they say it's a second process to put it on the no, hard no, drive. No, no, no. In that case, don't. Because what they're doing is they're ripping it for you. They're selling you. It's an upsell. They're selling you the hard drive and ripping it to the hard drive. You can do that yourself. That's for, so, that's so if not, I just get the DVD and rip it to the computer, do you think that that, considering it's 8 millimeter, that's good enough quality yes. that I can edit it and you yes. know make up another DVD of certain things? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome, Franny. And I hope that works out. Would you do me a favor, though? Do one first. Yeah, they require 250 feet of film. Okay. First. And so how much a just, foot is it? Um, it's 69.95 for DVD for 250 feet of film, which I believe is five three-inch uh, reels. Okay. I I'm looking at the site now. Okay. Uh, I'm looking at Scan Cafe, which is a national service, same idea. They charge 20 cents a foot for uh, 8 millimeter. Okay. So um, I, don't know, I don't know what this New Jersey company is. You know, when I had my slides scanned, I used a local company. Uh, I think right, I understand I that. You said your sister took them Yeah, there. Providence, Rhode Island. And they right. did a great job. Those were slides, not, uh, not f film. I think it's so worth doing this. And film does decay, and not as fast as, say, magnetic tape. But it does decay, and so it's worth getting this done. You'll have oh, these I forever. I want to do it. I just want to do it right. Yeah, know? I don't blame you. Well, here's the good news. It, will, it probably won't in any way damage the film to have this done. Okay. Um, you, 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 I would look at Scan Cafe just to see. They're a little, it sounds like they're a little less expensive. In it. And what you're looking at is how much post-processing they do. What do they do after the fact? How, do they clean the film before they scan it? What's the process involved? Okay. And I bet you this New Jersey company sends it out, <laughs> to be honest. Ah, I, I you know, never even considered yeah, that. Yeah, if you take it to Costco, they'll send it out. So you might ask, do you do this yourself? And ask about the process. Do you clean the film before you do it? You really want them to do that. That's with the glove, with the wake glove. Like, mm -hmm. you know. Because uh, this has collected dust over the time. You don't want to see all those <laughs> dust particles and grain and all that stuff. Right. Okay. Quick question. Leo, I've had a 3GS. I love it. Yeah. And I'm going to upgrade to 4S, but I love the big size. You keep showing your... I know. Galaxy. I know. The, you know the, uh, it makes me mad that Apple has stuck with this 3.5-inch screen. This is very typical of Apple. They're fairly conservative uh, when it comes to uh, hardware. They don't rush to get the latest greatest. So there are many bigger screens, higher resolution screens. That Nexus uh, that I'm going to get is essentially very close to the same resolution as the iPhone, but in a four and a half inch screen, that's a big difference. I want the screen, but I want the simple process of Apple. And can you, you like Apple, me? yeah. So one thing you might want to do if you can wait six months. Okay. The uh, and it's you know we nobody knows what Apple's doing. It may be now that Steve's gone, it, people might, some of this might start getting out a little bit. I think it, I don't think it's a bad thing for it to get out a little bit. Apple is really kind of paranoidly secretive. However, the rumors are, and this comes mostly from Asia, where the parts have to be ordered and the stuff has to be made ahead of time. The rumors are that the next iPhone, which probably, okay, I'm going to say everything's probable, probably will be out in June, might be much more like this Samsung form factor. Thin with a 4-inch or maybe better, 4.3 or 4.5-inch screen. That's the rumor on the next iPhone. Um, and it would make sense for Apple to do that, especially since they're so irate at Samsung right now and they're suing them like crazy over their phones. Now, you have to think, Samsung thinks this, I know, because they've asked to see the designs for the next iPhone and the next iPad. Samsung thinks that Apple's phones are going to look just like these Galaxy S2s. <laughs> That's what I think. 
Uh, and I think it's credible that it would be out uh, June of next year. I think Apple wants to get back on track. The iPhone 4S was late, remember. Starting in June 2007, it's been every summer like lockstep until t this year when they missed their date in 2011. didn't come out till September. The question is, is Apple going to make it September now? Or are they going to make it June? I think there's no question that they will release a new iPhone every year. So sometime in the next year, there will be a new iPhone. I'm pretty sure, Fran, Franny, that it'll, it'll have a bigger screen. It may also have 4G, so it may, it may be worth waiting if you can. 3GS is two generations old. I think this 4S is fantastic. I think you'll like it a lot. Look at it. Maybe you will like it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, a good day to you, Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. And it's time to talk about computers, the internet, cell phones, camcorders, MP3 players, home theater, and whatever it is you bought on Black Friday. You know, uh, Thanksgiving was Thursday, right, in the U.S. Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. They call it Black Friday because the, uh, you know, the story goes, if you look it up on Wikipedia, that that's the day merchants... If they've been having a bad year, they've been in the red all year long, get to go in the black. I always thought it was something like, oh, it's scary and horrible, and that's why they call it. No, it's because they get to be, you know, they sell so much on Black Friday, they go in the black. It turns out it is not the biggest shopping day of the year. It never has been. The last Saturday before Christmas always has been. Now, tomorrow, <laughs> so it's some lazy reporter probably 20 years ago that said Black Friday. And, of course, it's gone crazy. I mean, that, there were fights at Walmart. There were, people were pepper sprayed at Walmart. I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, I, I don't know why people go for I guess because, you know, if you get there at 4 a.m., you know, you can get one of the four items that they have on sale for uh, pennies. I don't know. In any event, uh, tomorrow, same reporter probably or someone of that same ilk made up the, the, the name Cyber Monday. The theory being, and if you think about this, this is nuts. The theory being people wanted to shop after Thanksgiving. For some reason, that's the day everybody wants to shop. But they weren't going to go online to do it until they got back to work because, we're, because at work they have their fast Internet connection. All right, just show of hands here. How many of you have faster Internet connections at work than you have at home? Not us. Nobody. <laughs> you know why? Because at home, it's you. And at work, it's like all the everybody else all using it. Kyle Benham, my musical director, says, not us. That's right. Nobody goes, nobody goes shopping at work, waits to go to work to do their cyber shopping. That's nutty. I have to say, though, you watch because things like the Kindle and the iPhone and the other smartphones, I bet you this year uh, there will be a significant amount of shopping done from mobile devices. Wouldn't that be interesting? You're waiting in line at Walmart, <laughs> and you go online and you buy it. Uh, this Kindle Fire um, is, I mean, among other things, Amazon, it, it seems to be after a, after we got it in our hot little hands, I fix it, tore it down, people looked at the components and so forth, and, and the guesstimate was that it costs probably just slightly more than 200 bucks to make. It means Amazon's selling them as close to cost as they can, maybe a little bit under. I don't think they could sell it under because really what this is, what if you think about this Kindle Fire, which is a 7-inch tablet for $200, is what the way Amazon thinks of it. It's a portal to buy stuff on Amazon. So it means you're carrying around with you the Amazon store wherever you go. Whenever you got some downtime, you can go shopping, look at stuff. You know, I fired up my, uh, they have an Amazon shopping app, of course, right on the front page of the device. I fired it up, and uh, it's recommending deals of the day, Kindle Fire Protection Plan, Kindle Fire Leather Cover by Marware, already bought that, $45, Glare Screen Protection, books I might like, printers I might like. <laughs> and you just look at it and go, oh, you know, I just recently bought a camera lens, so it's saying, well, maybe you'd like to buy this $2,000 camera lens, since you already bought one. Or maybe you'd like to buy a $2,000 body for the camera lens you bought. Maybe you'd like to know more about jumbo ballpoint pens. See, it knows I bought a giant pencil. 
a couple of weeks ago. So it says, you know, to go with that giant pencil, perhaps you'd like a pack of six jumbo ballpoint pens, just seven dollars and ninety nine cents. <laughs> and how much? I mean, I mean, just think about how much stuff is going to get purchased this way. This is dangerous. I got one click turned on. All I have to do is tap it. It'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Talk about impulse purchases. Oh, man. So I suspect, I mean, we know Black Friday is a myth created by the press. We know that Cyber Mondays, if it wasn't a myth then, it's certainly a myth now created by the press. And I wonder if going forward, it's uh, every day is going to be a day people shop, no matter where they are. The good news is Black Friday, the merchants bought into it, and they've gone crazy with deals, and there were some amazing deals. I'd love you to call me with the best deal you got. If you want to gl gloat and brag, go ahead. I know Best Buy had a what? They had a was it a forty inch TV, forty two inch TV for three hundred bucks. What was the best deal you got for Black Friday? Eighty eight, eighty eight. Ask Leo. Eight 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 two seven five five three six. That's the number. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. Christine is in Oakland, listening to the great KGO. Hi, Christine. Hi, Leo. How are you? Very well. How are you? Um, I am looking for a really, really easy to use point and shoot camera for my mother who is not technically inclined. Mm. Um, I've done a little bit of research, kind of best point and shoot seem to come up um, as being either the Canon PowerShot or the Sony Cyber. Yeah, I love the Canon S100. Okay. Uh, that's so the highest end point and shoot out there. Beautiful camera. Easy to use? No. Yeah. Is she? So she's just. Does she have a computer? She does have a computer. Oh, okay. Um, and she uses it. Because a digital it. camera is nonsense if you don't have a computer. It's like, what are you going to do with it? Right. Right. And I live close enough that I will be the one you, downloading. You, you, the Mom, let me show you how you do this. Because I tell you, it'll uh, it, take her about three years to figure out how to do it. Herself. Yeah. My my um, wife, very smart woman. She's of the same generation as me. Just not interested in technology took film pictures for years because she wanted prints. Right. And, and I never was able to convince her to go digital because she said, well, uh, so now what she does, she takes pictures with a digital camera. She brings the memory, she takes the memory out of the camera or just, I think she doesn't even do that. She brings the camera to the camera, the Photoshop, and says, print these. Mm -hmm. At great expense because, of course, digital photography, you take hundreds of pictures. Right. But now she's got a stack of prints. And, that, you know, your mom may end up doing that. You don't, I guess you don't have to. And she and she may do that as well. Yeah. Um, but most important is that she just needs a camera that um, that is really is yeah. a very basic. And point she's point. not and she's not uh, so tech savvy that she's going to say, you know, this was uh, this is only six megapixels. What are you no, thinking? No, no. She's 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 not going to print <laughs> anything bigger than a four by six. So Kodak has really focused on this segment of the market with their point and shoot cameras. Okay. They uh, they have you know the very fancy ones, but I wouldn't get it. I would just get an Easy Share, get the name Easy Share mm -hmm. uh, camera. It they couldn't. They're a hundred to two hundred dollars. They're very inexpensive, so you're not risking a lot. They're you know they're decent cameras. We're talking fourteen megapixels. We're talking eight x zoom. Mm -hmm. um, you'll you, if you if you look at the Kodak site, you'll see a variety of choices. One of the things it has that I think people who are not savvy like a lot is a big LCD in the back so that mm -hmm. it's like they can look at their print right after they take the shot. Mm -hmm. um, I would take a look at something like the 583, which uh, is around 100 bucks. It's not expensive. Very simple controls. Okay. So one of the things when I was researching that I liked about the Canon Power Shot is it seemed like it had a really good kind of auto scenes program. It does. Um, so does so the Kodak. Was, well, this was on the Canon. Yeah, all of them. All of them do that. Uh, if, if there's something similar on the, the yeah, Kodak. they all do okay. that. Okay. Um, I don't use that because um, uh, most of the time you'll do that on the computer. Right. I think if your if your mom's not really um, sophisticated, a Canon's going to really be complicated for her. Okay. Um, I would take a look at go to a camera store and play with mm -hmm. the Kodak. I think you'll agree it's very straightforward. Uh, push button, simple, and it's designed for, it's really designed for first time digital camera buyers. Has easy sharing too. Set her up on Facebook. She can share it to Facebook quickly. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Right. 
Good. Cool. I'll do that. Very cool. Thank you. I should just buy one, huh? They're probably You're cheap. On, oh, I'm on? Oh, sorry. I'm talking to myself here. Leo LeBlanc. <laughs> We're getting some reports from our chat room on their excellent deals on Black Friday. No, we didn't buy a dog, but... Uh, Walmart had a Samsung 47-inch LED LCD TV, LCD TV for $749. Somebody got a, a, a Samsung 55-inch LCD TV for $1,100. Bucks. That's a big screen for that price. Toshiba Blu-ray players at Best Buy for $40. 50-inch uh, Panasonic. That's a good. That's a good uh, plasma. For eight ninety nine Canadian, Finlay got that. Oh, this is this is impressive. People are getting good deals. I suspect those good deals continue, right? They don't just stop, or do they? Or do they just stop? Eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo. So Walmart had that Samsung thirty two inch for two seventy nine. That was that was a pretty good price. Forty two inch Samsung for one ninety nine. Gaming good. Modern Warfare 3, $18 on Amazon. 42 inch at Best Buy for $299.99. Wow. 8888 Ask Leo. People are gloating on the great deals they got. Meanwhile, let's go to Honolulu. Oscar's on the line. Hi, Oscar. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Aloha. Aloha. I want to upgrade from an old Mac, uh, I'm at 24. And I, you know, go on the Mac site, and I'm just wondering, is it really worth the extra bucks for the maximum amount of RAM and also a solid-state hard drive rather than a normal hard drive? Well, you're right. It's a lot extra, especially when you're buying from Apple, which tags a 50% premium on everything they sell. Um, uh Well, <laughs> I, should, I should point out I'm sitting in front of a 27-inch i7 iMac with a 256 gig SSD drive and a spinning drive. I mean, I, I put my money where my mouth is. Yeah, I spent all that money, 8 gigs of RAM. And it was, by the time I was done, almost $4,000. It was ridiculous. I don't want to go that high. But yeah, I don't blame you. I design and Photoshop heavily in my oh, okay. business. And, and I've just noticed this iMac 24, it's just, it just drogs it when I put all those programs yeah. on it. Yeah, here's what I would do. I guess the order that I would put my money, first of all, bigger screen. Yes. For what you do, 27 inches, you got to have it. Yep. The good news is that's all the IMAX are 27 now. So um, I do that. They might still sell the littler ones, but uh, most of them are the 27. Um, next most important thing for you would be uh, four gigs of RAM. I think you, you might benefit from going to eight. If you have really large InDesign projects or really large images. So get 8 gigs of RAM. That's number two. Number three is an SSD drive. Notice, by the way, processor is way down on this list. SSD drive makes a big difference uh, in terms of boot times and application load times. It will make a difference in uh, loading your InDesign documents. Lots of, you know, like two or three times faster. But yeah, I have to say Apple doesn't... Yeah, well, you'll be you'll notice a massive difference. I have to say that Apple does not use the fastest SSDs. The problem with an iMac is it's not it's non-trivial to open up and and put in a new drive. So I would say go ahead and get the Apple SSD. That makes a big difference. And then finally, processor. That's the 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 least important of all the bunch. Oh, it is. Oh, yeah. good. People often think the processor is the most important, and you just don't see much speed increase from the you know 20% bump in processor speeds that cost a couple hundred bucks. Where you see, or going from an i5 to i7, where you see a, a big speed increase, though, is a solid-state drive. It does make a big, big, big difference. That's what I wanted to hear. Yeah. It's expensive, and, and it doesn't have a lot of storage, but the nice thing is this is a desktop, so not a big deal for you to have an external firewire right. or someday... We'll have uh, these Thunderbolt drives, and uh, those will be just as fast as an internal drive, and uh, you can have as much capacity as you want externally. What, what do you think of the refurbs? Because you can save a lot of money by getting a refurb. I think a refurb is a great idea. Um, Apple's refurbs, if you get them from Apple, 
You got to get them from Apple, and this is true in general. When you got to refurbs, get them from the company. Make sure the full warranty still applies. In many cases, and I think this is true of Apple for almost everything they sell, these aren't really refurbs. They're just new, but they were open. Somebody bought it, right, right. said, "Oh, you know, I didn't want that," and sent it back. They cannot. State law does not allow them. I think federal law does not allow them to sell that as new. So they have to sell it as refurbed, and that usually means it's as good as new. Somebody bought it and returned it. Well, that's good news. That's what I was hoping to hear. That's why the savings aren't thousands, but they're hundreds. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. I uh, encourage you to upgrade. You'll notice a big difference. Because he's using, folks, very high. And InDesign is a uh, page layout program. Magazines use it, books. Um, and it, it, you know, these are Adobe products. They're, they use a lot of RAM if you've got it. They'll use hard drive space if you've got it. A fast scratch disk makes a big difference in Photoshop and InDesign. So, uh, you know, this is a case where he's doing high-end stuff. Now, it's not true for everyone. Uh, SSD is, a, is an expense. Having said that, I buy, these are the solid-state drives. They're made out of flash memory, same kind that's in your camera, except that, uh, you know, it's a lot more, 256 gigs or 128 gigs or 64 gigs. It makes a big difference in boot times and application launch times, in... Uh, Writing times less so, mostly in reading, but but really can make a huge difference. Uh, I have to say with my MacBook Air, my 2010 MacBook Air, which came with a 64-gig drive, I ran out of space so quickly, I decided I'm going to upgrade this. I went to MacSales.com and I bought one of their upgrades. It's funny, the solid-state drives in the MacBook Air really look like memory cards. They're not, they don't look like drives. You snap them in, it's, very, it's a very easy upgrade to make. Um, and that made a big difference in speed and, of course, capacity. Having 64 gigs felt a little tight, a little bit of a squeeze. Try. We're going to take a break. When we come back, Tim in Dublin wants to buy a camcorder. Really? Let's talk about it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Extreme. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Chris Marquardt, the photo guy, is here. He is the host of a great podcast for photographers and photo buffs called Tips from the Top Floor. At, uh, well, I'll just say chrismarkworth.com is probably the best thing to do. Uh, he also hosts great workshops. I know you've got one coming up, in fact, next weekend, so he won't be here for uh, next weekend. But, Chris, we have a, an assignment to review, and I'm glad you showed up for this week because this is we've got to get this done. Yeah, hey. absolutely. Uh, one assignment a month, I think, is a good time yes. frame. So we had the assignment screen, and I was very curious what would come in and uh, I must say, the people people are very very creative. We have uh, three really really good pictures here. So so let me let me explain what this is for people who uh, don't know, and and then we'll show these pictures and we'll tell you where you can find them. Actually, we have links and probably images as well on the uh, website, techguylabs.com. dot com. Um, I'll forward the uh, email to you, James, so you can put those up there. But um, what we do every month is Chris picks a, a, a topic, a word, a rule, gives you an assignment. It's not a competition. It's, there's no prizes, but just gives you an assignment, a reason to go out and shoot. Uh, take pictures around this assignment. This week, actually this month, he said screen. That's all he said, screen. Computer screen, fly screen, I don't know. Screen. You could pick what you want. Football screen pass, I don't know. And illustrate that. And what it does, it gives us all an excuse to get out there with our cameras. Once you take a picture, you upload it to Flickr. Uh, you, you'll need a Flickr account, but they're free. Uh, and put it on our Tech Guy uh, group there. And we have a lot of people in the Tech Guy group and thousands of pictures up there. Do put the in the tag a word describing, you know, in this case, screen, so that we know that that's your submission. Once a week, you can put up a new picture there. And then Chris, every month, goes through all the submissions and picks a few to say why they're interesting, why they're inspiring, why they're great photos. So, Chris, you've picked three. I picked three. And um, actually, the instructions are also on the Tech Guy group. So if you go to find the Tech Guy group on Flickr, uh, Orbit Gal puts the instructions there so you will know what to tag the image with. Right. And yeah, screen, um, we, we, we actually get a lot of fly screen pictures. <laughs> I like that because I, I kind of thought people would go more for computer screens and things, but um, fly screen is just perfect. So um, two of those pictures are kind of among those that where people go, how, how did they do that? So I want to look a bit at that. So um, the first picture is by WEMP13032. It's called Screen Drops. And it is a... Uh, well, it, it's a fly screen, but then it also drops on a window. And, and what you see is that um, the photographer 
basically threw those the, the fly screen out of focus. But now in the drops, because they act like little magnifying glasses, um, it, it brings the fly screen right out again. This was about and, the most and, clever picture I could imagine. Wonderful. I, you've got to see it. Uh, just you'll have to imagine it. This there, you you see that there is a screen, but it's out of focus. These drops are on the screen, and they've brought it into focus. So he focused on the drop, I guess, yes, not and, the screen. And, and and because those drops are not like perfectly round, because they have like little odd shapes, they're flat, some are flatter than the others. You have these different kinds of things that those little magnifying glasses do with the fly screen. So it's, it's a lot of variation in there, even though it's like almost like a monochrome picture. But um, those little shapes really add a lot of interest to it. So that's, that's a very good trick. It's just amazing. Just amazing. By the way, I think we've broken Flickr. <laughs> we sent everybody Have to Flickr, we? and it says Flickr has the hiccups. We're looking into the problem right now. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> the power of Leo Laporte. <laughs> uh, well, there are about a million people listening. I guess if they all went to Flickr at the same time, even the mighty Yahoo would get broken. Ooh, Sorry, okay. Yahoo. Here's uh, picture number two. This comes from John Thumb of Manchester, yep. England. Yep, and it's it's a fly screen. It even the title says fly screen. You know what's great? This is an iPhone picture. Oh yes, and that that is one of the things I like because it was taken with a, just a simple iPhone. Um, that's a very capable camera in there, and especially in the hands of someone who has a, a bit of a creative mind and a, a bit of a photo eye. And uh, John Thum certainly has that. Um, that that's a, a almost kind of an abstract picture. It's kind of hard to tell the size of things, so it could be a bigger kind of screen. But I just like the geometry in it and the simplicity of this picture. It's really and, amazing, and the fact that it was taken yeah. with an iPhone just blows my mind. Yeah, absolutely. it just shows so, that it's it's it. You know, first of all, the iPhone cameras are very very good, but really, it's the camera you have and. You should never feel like, oh, I can't take a picture. I don't have a, a good camera. You, if you've got a decent phone, you have a decent camera. I just true. love this Absolutely image. True. It just, just is really spectacularly beautiful. I could imagine that printed out up on a wall. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, John Thumb. Finally, uh, from Ryan <laughs> Frostad. Um, How did took, he do that? <laughs> this is, uh, I love it. I, I don't know if it's trick photography or what. But he's got a laptop with a picture of itself in there, with a picture of itself in there, with a picture of itself in there, with a picture of it. It's, it's kind of a, one of those recursive things that, that keeps it. It's like, it's like, that, like those two mirrors that are adjacent of each other, and you look into them, and it goes all the way, right. makes a tunnel kind of thing. Right. Um, and that, that is a computer tunnel. So what I think he did is he probably took that initial first picture and then put it on the screen and then took that picture again and put it on the screen. Probably had oh, the camera on a tripod. So I think that's it's actually a series of pictures shot off the computer screen. Yeah. And yeah. fed back into the computer. That it's makes a feedback sense. Loop, basically. Yeah, that makes sense. A manual, a manual feedback and loop. And then to so, focus on the uh, geometry of it, he made it black and white. So you're not looking at the color. You're yeah, looking at what happened. Nothing that distracts from the shapes and things and, and from the tunnel-y uh, thing that's going on there. So I love that. I really like that. I know you, I know you like to do that. Uh, in fact, I think two of these were black and white photos. The third might as well have been. Both of, all of them really were monochromatic uh, and, and because they're focusing on the geometry. And you like to do that with your pictures. It when helps. there's an interesting geometry, let that be the story, not the colors. It helps. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's another month, and we have another assignment coming up. Um, and this time I asked the chat room, and I got one that really stuck out, and that's by Stephen3x, and he suggested ice. Ice! Oh, it's a good time of year to do that. Absolutely, and um, there's so much that you can do with ice. Um, it, ice comes in so many different forms, and uh, you can do so many things with light and geometry and reflections and translucency and bubbles that are frozen. I don't know, there, there's so much... Uh, that can be done with ice on a macro scale, on a on a bigger scale, at lakes, in a in a puddle. I I don't know. There's like a, a thousand different possibilities there. So I think we we gotta do ice this time. You could even do diamonds. Oh yes. Yeah, I don't know if in Germany it's the same, but in the U.S., <laughs> ice is slang for a diamond. Oh, is it? No, yes. it's not here. Yes. So, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Another meaning. Good thing cool. for you to know. Cool. So uh, here's what you do. Flickr, F-L-I-C-K-R dot com. It's back up. Flickr dot com. Now, if you have a Yahoo account, Flickr is a Yahoo company, so you'll have an account there. If not, create a free one. You don't need the pro account. Uh, join the group. There'll be a groups menu at the top of the page. You can search for Tech Guy. Two words. When you find that group, 
And there are a lot of people in there, 8,671 members, 2,218 photos. Some of you are not doing your part. Make sure you uh, tag it with the word ICE, and you get to upload one a week. Orbit Gal will welcome you, and uh, the rules are always at the bottom of the page there on the front page of the of the group. In fact, she does other assignments as well. So it's really, if you're if you if you're an aspiring photographer and you want to take more, you want to take better pictures, taking more pictures is step one. And that's what this does for you. Chris is at chrismarquart.com. You're going to be, uh, what, is the, what is the work? I know it's probably sold out. The workshop you're doing next weekend, what are you going to do? It's in Dresden, Germany, and we're going to do night photography oh, wow. at uh, Germany's oldest Christmas market. <gasps> So it's a, it's a street photography combined with night and extreme exposure. So we're going to kind of mix it up a bit. How fun. Now, do, 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 do you post pictures from these groups? Where would you post those? Oh, they will actually be on Flickr. Um, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you know as soon as they're online. You'll make a group uh, on Flickr for the workshop. There'll, there'll be a tag or something that, that okay. people can find them, yeah. Oh, this will be fun. I'd lo I'd, I, I, am, I don't know why, but I got in the mood this year. Not every Good. year do I get in the mood, but I am in a holiday mood. C-H-R-I-S-M-A-R... Q-U-A-R-D-T dot com. Thank you, Chris Marquardt. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You know Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. VJ in uh, L.A., Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, VJ. Hi. Uh, hi, hi I, I have a Dell 1557, 64-bit machine, mm -hmm. and a Windows 7. Okay. It runs hot. Okay? Yeah. It's still, under, it's still under warranty. Earlier this year on March, April time frame, I would see, you know, it would freeze, and the air would be like a display adapter type issue. And... The Dell people, I mean, they obviously are in India, they would remotely log in and say, okay, it's fine now, and I would, it would work. Okay. It, this it happened a couple of times, and finally I said, look, this is probably a heating error you know, because it runs too hot. Right. And they will, I cannot seem to get anybody from the hardware side to come and fix it. Or I can't, I can't get a number in the U.S. for customer service. Did you, um, okay, so a couple of things. First of all, you're probably right. Very hard for them to diagnose that with their remote access software. They can't tell. Uh, one way to do that would be to get a, uh, or maybe that would help your case, would be to get a, a temperature sensing program. I have to point out, you know, these modern processors are very hot, and it's not at all unusual for a laptop to be hot to the touch. So right. that's not necessarily a problem. It may be, in fact, that this uh, laptop is hot. Um, does it have fans? Yes. Yeah. And the fans run even after you turn it off. It keeps going. You, know, you can yeah. hear the fan louder. And, and, you, and they're loud, right? Do you hear them ever get louder as you use it? Yes. Okay. That's why I'm worried. Yeah, I mean, that's also they're designed to do that. Um, okay. If it's hot, uh, you might try a laptop cooler. They're very inexpensive, eight or nine dollars USB. They're f they're basically a stand for the laptop with fans below it, and they will keep it cooler. Um, I would I would also download. And I'm not sure what would work for your computer because different temperature monitor programs work with different hardware. But if you can get a temperature okay. monitor program, your BIOS may also tell you the problem is by the time you've rebooted into BIOS setup, it's, you know, cooled off considerably. Correct. Um, it's not very old. It's still under warranty. So I don't think it's yeah. a question of dust. It could be a question of fan failure. It could be a, you know, it, there can be manufacturing defects. They put, I'll right. give you an example, uh, th when they put the cooling hardware onto the processor, onto the CPU, usually that's a fan, sometimes it's a passive device, they use a paste, a thermal paste, to make a thermal connection to the processor so that the processor heat is efficiently conducted into the cooling hardware. If that too much paste or too little paste was used, more commonly it's too much paste, it won't do the job. And so it could be that in the manufacturing process, somebody was asleep at the switch and went quick, quick, put too much paste on there. There's all sorts of things that can happen. The problem is how do we prove it to Dell? Now, the, right. the next thing is, 
Dell does offer, uh, you know, for no cost, fairly poor service. This is true of all companies except Apple these days because they've unbundled the cost of support. That's why a right. Dell is so much cheaper than an Apple. Uh, one right. of many reasons, but that's one of the reasons. You can get gold support, so you can pay for higher level U.S. based support, but you have to pay no, for I, it. I have, I have a two-year warranty, two-year support warranty. Oh, you do, and you're still not getting yes. U.S. support. No. I'm still getting people in India. Unfortunately, I know the language doesn't help. <laughs> well, they, sometimes they don't even want to admit they're in India. Uh, right. I mean, I can <laughs> no, my that. name's Ralph. What are you talking about? <laughs> right. Exactly. It's frustrating. They won't, won't let me talk to anybody in the U.S. I, how do I get through the system? Wow. Um, it's ridiculous. It's sad because Dell was for years the best support in the business but then and that's the, why i've been buying dell for 20 years me too and i quit me yeah. too and it, unfortunately uh what's happened is uh dell uh with everybody else in the pc industry had to drop prices it got very competitive right. and unbundle right. support now you bought support did you buy gold what did you buy I don't remember. It's at home. I'm in the apartment. yeah they have different levels of support including a level of support where they come and get it Right. And I think that unfortunately, uh, even you, even when you paid for support, you didn't get. You're not getting great support, which is really, really, really sad. Okay, from what I understand, I'm supposed to have that. If there's a real problem, they are supposed to come to my house and fix it. Oh well, this is I terrible. Then here's what you do: okay. you 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 write a letter to to uh, to Dell, to the okay. uh, the department to Michael Dell, CEO. <laughs> No, I'm not kidding. In fact, uh, this works for many companies. Most companies have an office of the CEO with okay. that is well staffed with people who respond to direct mails to the CEO. You say, okay. "I was just on a national talk show with Leo Laporte, and we were okay. bemoaning the quality of support. I cannot believe I can't get help from Dell. This is a lemon. This computer is a lemon, and I need to have it replaced." Okay. And you will get a call. Okay, so that's the, that's my best option, really. I hate to do it, but yeah, well, it sounds like it is. You've tried you've tried to go through channels. Yeah, they won't. Yeah, it's just you know, it's silly. It's almost a joke. It's really you know? sad, isn't but it? This used I to be know, such a great true. company, and you know, Michael Dell is on. You know, the other thing, Michael Dell is on G Plus. He's very engaged on G Plus. In fact, there are quite a few um, Dell people on G Plus. Twitter would be another way. It might even be a more direct way. Believe it or not, Twitter or G Plus, a social network. Uh, okay. At Dell, at Michael Dell, at Susan Beebe. There are a lot of social media people at Dell who would okay. probably listen. And the thing is, if you do it publicly as you would be doing it on Twitter and G+, I would do both. Okay. G+, G is Google+, Plus. I'm sorry, you're right, I should spell it out. It. Um, then I think you will, I, you, I bet you, you'll get a response within okay. 24 hours. And, and you should, okay. and you should, because that's terrible. Okay, one, uh, you mentioned that I should get a temperature sensing program. What Can you give a name, example? Uh, good one? or There's a good free one, and I can't remember. Maybe the chat room does. Uh, they're, also okay. says, they're also saying uh, that, um, while I look this up, they're also saying that Dells are notorious for running hot. I think all modern, uh, frankly, all modern laptops run hot. Okay. Uh, but, but you should but Google uh, uh, your model to see what and temperature to see what the normal scent temperature okay. should be. Because often these things are running at 35 to 40 centigrade. Really, really hot. Wow. Yeah. And that's normal. They're expected okay. to run that hot, and you would feel it. I mean, that, that, that's, that's yeah. too hot to touch. That's 104 Fahrenheit. What do you yeah. That's, that's too hot to touch. Um, right. I, you know, it's been a while since I've used temperature sensor software. Um, so I'm not sure what the one that I would recommend, but you can, you can, you can Google that and there's quite a few programs out there. Look, there are free programs. Uh, speed fan is something that runs uh, on Dell's. In fact, I think it comes with speed fan, doesn't it? Check it anyway. Speed fan. Okay, CPU ID is another one. That's the one I've used before. Uh, open hardware monitor.org. There are a number of these and uh, the chat room is also telling me that uh, one of our uh, one of uh, my friends uh, Rafe Needleman who works at CNET had a problem with Adele, complained on Google Plus and got responded to and fixed within 24 hours. Okay, two, two, uh, two, uh, two quick questions for you in that case. Number one, 
is that that's, if, it's running, if, if it's running too hot, doesn't that shorten the life of the laptop, basically? Well, the, the question is, what is too hot? All processors are rated right. for a certain temperature. All of the components are rated for a certain temperature. Uh, okay. If 40 degrees is probably, I wouldn't want to see it running more than 40 centigrade. Uh, okay. But, uh, you know, certainly not 70 centigrade. You're right. At that temperature, 70, you are shortening the life of all the components. Um, exactly. So it depends on how well designed it is. Of course, laptops are very tight. Right. So, you know, you just, one hopes that uh, it's within tolerances. But the fact, if you're having, if you're having shutdown issues. Yes. It sounds like maybe that the, the GPU, the graphics card, is, is right. not handling that heat well. That's exactly right. I, told you, I mean, that's one thing I saw a long time ago. This display adapter graphics card was an issue. Right. And they just totally blew me off. You know, okay, so that might be that it, it, is, not being, it is not being cooled properly. The that's that's card. very possible, yep. Although that's, that's the chat room is saying, you know, I've seen, they've seen GPUs go up to 90 centigrade. <laughs> that's wow. almost 200 degrees. Yeah, that's... <laughs> I wouldn't want to see it that hot. I really wouldn't. I would no. say 40 to 50 is normal. Anything okay. above 50 is something to be concerned for. If you're seeing 70, 80, 90, you got a problem. Okay, good. Okay. So That's centigrade, by the way, folks. Cent Celsius, not uh, Fahrenheit. Well, I understand that. Yeah. My best bet is to look at Google Plus and write to him also a letter. I would and write. Well, I first start with the Twitter and Google Plus. And okay. if you don't get a response there, and I bet you will, then write a letter to Michael Dell, CEO. Dell Computers, Round Rock, Texas, and I know you'll get an answer. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, a good day to you, Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. And it's time to talk about computers, the internet, cell phones, camcorders, MP3 players, home theater, and all that jazz. The, the techno lust that fills your life. 8888-ASK-LEO is my number. That's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. 1-888-827-827. 5536. I'd love to hear from you if you've got a question, comment, suggestion, want some help with that Black Friday doodad or G jaw that you bought. Somebody sent me an email saying, A Leo that's pronounced Gigaw. <laughs> he said, I've, I've been hearing you for, for buds mispronounced G jaw. It's Gigaw, please. All right, pardon me. <laughs> Gigaw. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't even know there was an official pronunciation for a nonsense word. 8888, ask Leo, that's the number. Uh, one, of the, one of the great things about covering technology on the radio is most technology coverage, even today, is on the web or in print. And so many words are never pronounced for most people, right? They just read it. And no one knows how to pronounce it. So as, as one of the few people who actually works in an audio medium, I get to decide often how words are pronounced, wrongly or rightly. It was, I'll t every time I say GIF or GIF for the G-I-F graphics format, I'll get an email saying, no, you're saying it wrong. And then, of course, the guy who created the GIF format finally had to put up a blog post saying, well, I say it this, but does he get to decide? I don't know who gets to decide. It's made up. I say giblets. Do you say giblets? 8888 <laughs> ask Leo. The real problem is the English language. And I was taught this in school that G, the letter G, when it's followed by A is hard, E is soft, George. I, well, we, we haven't figured that one out yet. Giraffe or gift, I don't know. O is always hard, right? <laughs> Unless the word is enough, in which case, I don't know. <laughs> so the real problem is English. It's inconsistent, folks. No one has figured out how to pronounce anything. You get to, cho you get to choose. GIF or GIF, it's up to you. I I'll take either. Vicki, Richmond, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Vicki. Hey, uh, thanks for taking my call. I was calling about that HP touchpad. What's the deal with it? What's the deal <laughs> with the HP touchpad? They sold it originally for $400 plus, right? And then um, HP, really the bigger question, Vicky, is what's the deal with HP? Yeah, I, I am, getting, I am getting a uh, one of those touchpads for Christmas. Great. It's 99 bucks. It's a great deal. Yeah. Um, is it going to work, though? Well... 
<laughs> yeah, it's not broken. Uh, it's limited. So here's the problem with the HP touchpad. HP invested over a billion dollars in wow. an operating system called WebOS that was developed by Palm. Remember, the Palm Pre was a phone with WebOS. Uh, Palm struggled, couldn't make it, and HP bought them and, more importantly, bought WebOS. Uh, then HP made a tablet with WebOS, and people like me were very interested initially because I liked WebOS. But once we got the tablet, we said, oh, this is terrible. Slow, sluggish. There's no software available for it. We love WebOS. We wish somebody would make hardware that takes advantage of it. Then, HP, this isn't the end, because then HP, their CEO at the time, Leo Apotheker, decided, you know, I don't even like the hardware business. He had come from a software uh, services business. So he said, we're going to spend a billion dollars on this British company called Overture. It's a services company. And we're going to divest the PC division, and we're going we're gonna to kill WebOS. <laughs> we're going to stop making the touchpad. And by the way, we still have got uh, like 100, 200, 300,000. Let's sell them for 99 bucks. And then it sold like hotcakes. And they said, well, we still have parts. We'll make some more. Continue to sell for 99 bucks like hotcakes. Leo Apotheker was fired because the HP board said, this guy's a goofball. Meg Whitman, remember her for running for Cal uh, governor of California and, uh, and former CEO of eBay, was hired to run the company. Meg said, hmm, I'm going to do a study. Seven days later, she said, well, I guess we won't get rid of the PC division. It turns out that's pretty good. And as for WebOS, no one knows. So the real problem with that tablet is not the price, not the hardware. It all works. Is is there going to be a future for it? And that's just unknown. Yeah, because I, I got one. I didn't pay $99 for it. I paid quite a bit more. Oh, you bought one. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, but I, I hadn't heard any of the, I hadn't heard anything about it. I just thought, it, you know. There's the story. It's the silliest soap opera ever. And, it's, and it just shows HP, which was one of the great companies. Let me tell you, this is the company that started Silicon Valley back when Hewlett and Packard they were in a garage in the, what was it, the 30s in Silicon Valley. This was what started Silicon Valley. It was a great company for many years. Still is a great printer company. It's still, I mean, there's so many things going for it, but boy, have they bungled it. And, 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 and you know, I think your touchpad, if you like it the way it is, just leave it. That's it. That's what you got. It works. It does what you want. The software that's on there, fine. I don't expect there'll be any updates. I don't expect there'll be any new software. It is what it is. All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I think a lot of people bought that touchpad at 99 bucks, saying, well, what can you do? Now, I should point out that it is possible to hack it if you're, uh, if you're adventurous. They, uh, you could put Android on it. There's a hack for it to wipe the firmware off and uh, put Android, put uh, Cyanogen Mod CM7 on it. You could Google touchpad space CM7, the number 7, and find out how to do that. It's not uh, impossible. It's certainly doable. Um, and then you'll have, you know, it's decent hardware. You'll have a nice Android tablet. It is unclear. It may be that HP, you know, they, they're waffling. It may be that HP, in fact, will not they, they, they kept the PC division. Maybe they'll keep the touchpad division. Maybe they'll keep WebOS. They spent a billion dollars, a billion, a billion with a B dollars on this thing. Tim, in Dublin, we're going to have to take a break in a second, Tim, but we'll get you, get your question on, and I can uh, come back and help you. I'm sorry to put you on hold for so long. Thanks for your patience. Absolutely, Bill. Thanks. Uh, I'm with a company who's go to meeting quite regularly for uh, meetings. Love and that. I love go to meeting. Love go to meeting. And that they have the new HD, so you can have uh, video conference. Isn't that awesome? Phone. Have you used the HD faces? Just a couple of times, and it seems to be pretty effective. It's amazing. I love it. And the point is, we're going to have some pretty important meetings coming up fairly soon, and on a regular basis, we'll be doing these. And I hate the thought of just using a plain old webcam. You know, Logitech makes a nice HD one, but I'm thinking more along the lines of a... Of a uh, camcorder because I think it's got more functionality and could be <clears throat> very effective. But I can't find anybody who can help me get that done. Well, I will help you, and it is tricky. And I frankly am very happy with the Logitech cameras, and I think that that's what Citrix, who makes Go to Meeting, even recommends. But I'll talk about how to use a camcorder for a webcam when we come back. Leo Laporte, the e Tech Guy. <laughs> that's me, baby. I am Leo Laporte, the tech guy, taking care of business. 
Ask Leo. Uh, we were talking to Tim in uh, Dublin, California. He uh, he is doing uh, video conferencing, which is the thing nowadays. And he wants a better camera. I, to be honest, I think those Logitechs are fantastic. And one advantage of the Logitech is it, because it's USB, it's very straightforward. You just plug it in the computer. The computer recognizes it. They've got the software to support it. It couldn't be easier. So I wouldn't eschew the uh, the Logitech, say the C nine ninety webcam. I think they're. I think it's spectacularly good. I'm concerned because I'm going to have a gentleman who's going to make presentations standing next to a screen, and I can't necessarily focus. Oh, that's, that's interesting. That. I got it. Yeah, and the nice thing about a camcorder is you can you can hold it, you can move it, you can zoom, you can focus. Exactly. Camcorders, of course, also do white balance better. They do focus better. They do zooming. There's a lot of things they do. And the audio is a lot clearer. That's true, too. That's too true. All right, so um, here we go. Let's talk about the issue. So you've got to have some, first of all, not all camera camcorders have live pass-through of video. That's number one. So, so many camcorders uh, only record. They don't act as a camera. Uh, and that's very important because you want to uh, hook up uh, the computer to the camera via either HDMI or composite or component, have it go into the computer, and you want it to be doing that while you're holding it. Uh, then you also uh, have to be able to set the camera uh, to a something that's compatible with your computer, making sure that it's you know if not if it's widescreen and, you, and your computer's not doing widescreen things like that. Um, we use, I'll tell you what we use that would work, but it's 1500 bucks. is uh, the Canon Vixia G10. I think it's the HF G10. It's a high-def camera that I'm on right now, so it's very good quality. And we're using it right now exactly as you would use it. It's video pass-through right now. The other thing that's nice is if you take the battery out, it doesn't give you the pop-up warning. It doesn't shut down. You don't see anything on the screen. You just you use it as a camera, a video camera, as a camcorder. Uh, no, uh, like a studio camera. That's how you want to use it, like a television camera. Okay, that's exactly the model I'm looking at. Yeah, it's a beautiful, uh, highly, well, all you have to do is go to twit.tv and look at the video. And that's okay. streaming. That's not even the highest quality it can do because we're, stre we're compressing it heavily so we can stream it to you. And it's a fantastic camera. What other software do I have to have on the PC? Well, now this camera has HDMI out, so you need HDMI in on your or computer. Firewire. Uh, or FireWire. Or FireWire, yeah. Now, we don't use it with a FireWire pass-through, but it does do that, right, John? The uh, G G10 will do a FireWire pass-through of video like a camera, studio camera. I believe it will. You'd have to get the cable, but yeah. yeah. So, the, so the, if you go to camcorderinfo.com, that's a great site, and they will tell you which ones have live pass-through. That's, that's the thing you're looking for is live pass-through. Live pass-through. If I do that, just hook it up, but I should be able to use it. As that. long as you've got a way to get it in, FireWire is a good way to do it. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Good, Tim. Appreciate your time. You're welcome. I'm sorry it took so long to get to you. Yeah, we've been very happy with these... Uh, uh, right, the HFG10, the Vixia, very happy with these. These are high-end consumer-grade camcorders, but they're on 24/7. We 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 do video all day, all week, uh, and they get great uh, image quality. I'm very very happy with them. I I wouldn't hesitate recommending them. Now, the way we are getting video out of them, we take the HDMI out and pass it through a box that converts it to something called serial digital interface or SDI. That's, that box comes from Black Magic. It's about three hundred dollars, and it converts it to uh, something that we could put a coax cable on and can go hundreds of feet. Because of course we've got to get the camera in, that's in my studio out into the basement, where this actually we go through the rafters, then down into the basement, and then around. It must be three hundred feet or four hundred. It's a long way. SDI will do that. Um, yeah, you want to. D is saying in our chairman, this is absolutely true. You want a clean live pass through. You don't want any text on the display uh, we are able to do that with the G10s most camcorders I've seen you can turn the text off on the display you know you don't want the date you don't want a you know zoom icon you don't want any of that stuff on the display uh, David McDee is saying he got a Vixia HV40 these were the best you know they don't put firewire on cameras anymore so that is a good point the HV40s and HV30s we use those for a long time and they stopped making them, but you can find them for around three or four hundred bucks. Excellent. 
we bought, didn't we buy a bunch of HV40s just to, we, we bought three HV40s as they were going out of business, or not going out of business, but discontinuing the model because we like them for camcorders. So if you can find them, highly recommended, a lot less expensive, FireWire out, and that's the key. You got to have FireWire out, and, and because most people aren't using FireWire anymore, most camcorders do not come with FireWire anymore. So that's something you got to have pass through, and you got to have FireWire. Otherwise, how are you going to get it? Uh, Kathy in Monrovia, California. Hi, Kathy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello, first time caller. Thank you. Welcome. You, hi, you have so much knowledge about so many different things, and I appreciate it because some things I'm a newbie, and some things I have a little electronics background. Good, good, good. Well, that, that, that's good. If you have that background, there's nothing you can't learn. Right. And uh, I've been hunting for a few days for a TV because my last cathode ray tube that I could bear to watch either you know a good movie or football <laughs> on is kaput. Yes, so, it's time for a new TV. Yeah, and I don't think anybody makes uh, CRTs anymore. <laughs> you should be jumping up and down. I'm telling you, Kathy. Okay. I know you're. There's a pain in the price, although this is the best time ever to buy these oh, things. Yeah. Uh, but and you I will love how they look. Well, I, I do like as much good picture as I can get, and um, I'm stuck on the plasmas. Yeah, um, so let me talk about plasma versus LCD very quickly, and Scott okay. Wilkinson will back me up on this. Plasma is the best, but has disadvantages. It, uh, it's darker, so you need to darken the room. Also, because the screens tend to be highly reflective, they're glass. Uh, and um, it, it uses a little more power, although they're getting better on that. Uh, but blacks are better. Plasma is basically a better-looking image. It just needs a darkened room. LCD is good for the living room, the kitchen, anywhere where you don't want to draw the drapes, daytime viewing and all of that because it's a much brighter picture. But LCD's disadvantage, which you may really notice coming from CRT, is action, like sports or action movies, doesn't look as good on LCD as it does on plasma and CRTs. That's because plasmas and CRTs are faster. They have a faster response time. Okay. Okay. So I think for you, I think I think you probably want plasma because since you're coming from a CRT. Yeah, faster. Is that the same as refresh rate? No. Okay. Response time is the amount of time it takes for a pixel to go from all the way off to all the way on and all the way off again. On a CRT, it's instant. Yep. On a plasma, it's instant. On an LCD, it can be 9 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. That means that when stuff's moving really fast... The LCD can't keep up. It gets smeary. Now, they do some tricks. They do higher refresh rates. That's 120 hertz, 240 hertz. Those are tricks by interpolating frames that are designed to make action look better. To me, it makes it look like it's plastic or video. Okay. Oh, that was my other question about that. Hertz and the refresh. That's why they do that, be to, to compensate for slow response time. I figured. Um, I had another question. Well, hold on, because we're going to take a break, but I, I think this is a good topic. A lot of people buying TVs this week. We'll talk some more. 8888 Ask Leo. This is Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So we were talking. Who was I talking to? Oh, I was talking to Kathy in Monrovia. Hello, Kathy. Hello. She was uh, in the market for her first HDTV. How exciting. Oh, yeah. You're a talented guy with that little skit. That's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rogers. So he, uh, so not he, he me, we, <laughs> we're talking about uh, big screen TVs. You're going to see an immense difference. Now, I got to warn you one thing that when people move from a CRT, the old tube display to HDTV, sometimes there's disappointment. Mm -hmm. Because stuff like old TV shows, Andy Griffith and I Love Lucy, which are in standard definition, when you blow them up on a big screen, very crisp display, they look terrible. Because they weren't good, and your CRT kind of smushes it and smears it, and so you can't tell. Ah, yeah, okay. So just a world of warning. Now, on the other hand, high-def content, you will blow up, you, you know, you got to, and when you buy this TV, please buy a Blu-ray DVD player. Because that's the only really way you'll get uh, good quality video into it. There's two ways. One is over-the-air high def. Mm -hmm. The other is Blu-ray. A step down, although it's how most of us watch HDTV, will be your cable or satellite. They do offer HD. It's just not as good as uncompressed high def over the air and, and very little compressed Blu-ray DVD. It just I'm looks, it. yeah, it looks I'm so still good. On antenna right now. Yeah. Sorry, I'm still on antenna. Yeah, but you can get. Um, 
you can get uh, your antenna into your HDTV with the proper connections. Okay. Um, I did have a question, uh, one other, too quick. Uh, cold climate. I'm moving to a cold climate. If I leave the house and it drops down to 30 degrees, I understand plasma does better in a cold climate. Right. Than, yeah. But, so, but are you at altitude? I will be. 5,000 feet. Get ready for this. Okay. You have to... Plasma does not do well at altitude. Oh, no. You have to make sure, if you buy a TV, that you, that you check and make sure that it is a high-altitude plasma. I never heard of such thing. <laughs> so both of these things are the same issue, which is that plasma, the way plasma works is there are gas-charged cells. When air pressure goes down, as it does at higher altitudes, gas, it tends to outgas. Okay. Same thing with warm temperatures. That's why cool temperatures are good, but high altitude is bad. So, isn't that weird? So, if you're at high altitude, LCD. Okay. I hate to say it, but you can find high, high altitude plasma, but I wouldn't. I would just go with an LCD. It'll last longer. It'll look fine. The LCDs now are very, very good. Here's what you want. You want to make sure it's LED backlit. So, the way an LCD works is the liquid crystal in an LCD is basically a shutter that opens and closes to let colored light through. It needs a backlight. To push that light through, right? So there are you can backlight it with fluorescence. That's how we used to do it. And now almost all computers and televisions are backlit with LEDs. A couple of reasons they're better, their color is more consistent, and they last longer. They're also lower power. So LED is a good choice. They're all edge lit, unfortunately, now, but there are very good ones. If you have money to burn, Samsung's Elite, which is very expensive, is as good as plasma. Okay. Uh Oh, everything's 1080 now. How big is the screen going to be? Okay. How big is your screen? 50 oh, inches? Um, well, I'm still trying to be small. Don't I be small. <laughs> how, how big? 37. No. I need to go higher. Don't, yeah, don't be small. Yeah, LCD, okay. okay. Don't be small. Get, get, uh, you're going to want 50 inches. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. Did I say it's Samsung? I meant Sharp. Apologies. Sharp makes the elite. Thank you for the correction. Sharp. Okay. Yeah, and they're good. Oh, Sharp's great. Samsung or Sharp, excellent. Okay. Well, you yeah. know what? That's, that's going to help me a whole lot. You're so knowledgeable and about the details. So see, I need details to understand because that's understand. the kind of person the way I'm And you don't know if the guy in the store is telling you the truth. He might that's be trying true. to sell you something. Oh, in fact, he is. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> but I can count on you. Oh, that's cool. I'm right. not selling you anything except uh, maybe an occasional uh, Carbonite subscription. Thanks yeah. for the call, Kathy. Thank you. Enjoy. You know, the good news is, no matter what you get, it's going to be so great. You're going to flip your lid. You're going to watch way more TV than you ought to initially because it just looks amazing. And that's why I think it's good to get a Blu-ray player if you can because that's where you really see it. Get your favorite movie on Blu-ray and sit back, turn off the lights. It will blow your mind. You will. It looks better than a movie theater. And the reason you want big is because you want that movie experience. Um, and it... it even if you're only, say, 10 feet away, you want a 50-inch display, believe it or not. If you're 20 feet away, you would like to go even bigger, you know. 50 is a good I think 50 is a good size. I would say if you're buying an HD TV these days, buy a 50-inch. For one thing, they're not, you know, they're not expensive. This is a good time to buy it, and you'll be glad you have the larger size. They're all 1080p, all of them, uh, at that size. It's the smaller sizes where it, it might not matter, the, the budget TVs. Let's see. Marcia in Redondo Beach. Hi, Marcia. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello? Hello, Marcia. Hey, Leo. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for holding on. Oh, no problem. I have a question, and it seems like it's a, a unique question from the people I've asked. I thought it would be common, but, okay, I have cell phone service. Our whole family does. We re-upped with Sprint like two months ago, and or six months ago, I'm sorry. And the two phones that I got from them, I, I was just not happy with. They were the Android, and I didn't feel secure using them. So I went back to my LG, but like maybe a little more modern version of my original phone that I didn't uh, that I traded in. Okay. Well, now I want a real phone. <laughs> LG is horrible. It's, get an it. iPhone. You know, you can get an iPhone now. See, my only thing is, is I want to get a new phone, but I don't want to do another contract. 
because we just did one, and I don't want to pay the ridiculous amount of money if I don't re up. Well, how long ago? How long ago did you uh, 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 re up? How, how long? Six months. Oh yeah, you're out of luck. So there's nothing you can't buy a phone somewhere that I, I just it's like not with Sprint because uh, Sprint is a, a CDMA carrier. That means they have to activate the phone. So there's no way to sneak a new phone into the into the mix. You now you could go in, and I wouldn't I wouldn't hesitate to do this. Go into the Sprint store and tell them all this. Yeah, I did, and they just took too much pleasure in telling me that they couldn't help me. You know, oh, I'm sorry, that's how it is. <laughs> you know, I was just you know it was all I could do to reach over the counter and slap the girl yeah. in the face, but. Um, yeah, that's really a shame because, you know, the truth, it's also stupid of the sales rep because the truth is Sprint makes most of its money not on the phone. It right, makes most right. of its money on you every month, giving them 100 bucks, or if it's a family plan, more. So if I wanted to do the iPhone thing, I would just have to do that completely separate, right? Well, I maybe go to a different store. Keep trying. Uh, maybe find a rep who gets that. That keeping right. you as a customer is more important than worrying about the phone. Right, exactly. And, and be nice. Don't, don't be mean. Just say, no, oh, no, please, pretty please, with sugar on top of you, help me, please. Grovel. You, you grovel. <laughs> yes. Can I ask you one quick question? I'm interested in that dragon. What do you think about it? The dragon naturally speaking, me the dictation stuff? Right, right. It's great. You think it's great? Okay, okay, good. Well, right. if it's great if your expectations are reasonable. It's not like HAL 9000. Right. HAL, open the pod bay door. I'm sorry, Dave. Yes. I can't do that. It's more like I am going to speak slowly and clearly, but you will write down 90 to 99% of what I say correctly. The rest I have to correct. Leo Laporte, the ticker. All right, Leo, last live read, Carbonite Consumer. Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Did it say Leo? Where'd you find one that says happy birthday to Leo? Happy birthday to you. Wait, I, I gotta listen to this. Happy birthday, dear Leo. How do they do that? Did you get Marilyn Monroe to come in and record that just for me? Where did you find one with your with my name in it? It is my birthday on Tuesday. 55. That's ugly. Really ugly. Not something I want to celebrate. Uh, thank you, Kyle Benham, by the way, our musical director. He picks the music. Blame him. He puts a link on his Google Plus page of all the songs, a Spotify list, and we also will put that on our show notes. I have not mentioned all show uh, that we have a website. Please, techguylabs.com. Go there. Uh, James DeRuvo has been writing everything I say down, so all the links are there to all the stuff. But you'll also find a link to our chat room, which is great fun. Uh, video and audio of this show, uh, after the fact, podcasts, what else? All the show notes for 825 episodes. Wow. What are we going to do for the thousandth? When will the thousandth be? It'll be in 174 shows. So that is, what, 84? Five, 88 weeks. No, 87 weeks. Is that right? I got a ways to go. <laughs> it's a year and a half from now. Uh, Donna in Yorba Linda, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm super. Thank you. Thank you. I'd be much better if I could figure out what's going on. What's um, happening about now? Weeks, about two weeks ago, I... Um, Opened my Outlook, which is where I um, look at my emails. My email um, provider is is Yahoo, and I normally get you know maybe fifty or sixty emails, um, a couple three times a day. I check, um, and I checked in the afternoon, and all of a sudden I had sixty three thousand. Ah, <laughs> what? Sixty three thousand new messages. Right, exactly. <laughs> did you look? Uh, did you go to? Don't do this in your Outlook. Well, I guess you already have. Did you already download them all? No, no, I stopped it, and then I went to out to Yahoo, and there was like a hundred uh, messages coming into uh, out through Yahoo. Oh, that's interesting. So Yahoo only says there's a hundred. Right. It was it was Outlook that thought there were how many sixty. Well, now it's sixty-four thousand. <laughs> but when I called you uh, last, tried to call you last week, it was sixty-three thousand. Yeah. And and another thing too, I've noticed that uh, a bunch of the emails that I have. 
from a few weeks ago have duplicated themselves. Yeah, I would, I would guess so. I think that probably what's happened is there's 100 emails duplicated each 320 times. Oh, gee whiz. Um, something went wrong in Outlook. It got mm -hmm. it got broke. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. So the yacht when you go to yacht mail .yahoo .com, it does not report that many. And you look and the, and they all look normal. There's not a lot of junk in there and and everything. Right. right. And, but 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 the so yeah, I think Outlook is all messed up. So the okay. um, now uh, is there a mail on Outlook that you don't want to lose? Um, you know, I have Outlook set to leave the messages on the ser my server, yeah. so I imagine that they'd still be, okay. you know, be good. there. Okay, good, good. So here's what you do. Okay. Um, I, since you haven't ever deleted anything from the server. No. You, you can delete, what, uh, what I would start, I would go into Outlook and delete the Yahoo Mail account. Just say, oh, I don't need that one anymore. <laughs> okay. And start over, set it up again. Set it up from scratch. Yeah, and then I think one hopes. What happens with the pop mail, the way this works, is uh, yeah, the uh, Outlook sets a marker saying, I got everything up to this message. Mm -hmm. So that when it comes back, it doesn't re-download the mail. Something mm -hmm. went wrong there, and I think it's, oh, it's downloading and downloading and downloading the same thing over and over okay. and over again. So I think okay. this will be fixed if you just tell Outlook, oh, forget that account. Let's start over. Okay. And then it will just say, oh, yeah, there's 100 messages here, and boom, you're, you're done. Oh, okay. So just remove the, uh, the setup that I have for Yahoo yeah. now and then just re, uh, reinstall that setup I would. Uh, with all the correct settings. I and would. hopefully it will recognize what it's what it should, it should start. It should start all over. Okay. And you won't. You, whatever happened there will not happen again. Do you, do you okay. like Yahoo Mail? Um, it, it's okay. Are well, you, you paying, for the, paying for the pro version? Um, you know, I get it. I have AT&T. Oh, that's why, yeah. But yeah, it goes through yeah. that. I like Gmail so much more than Outlook. Plus, Gmail has much more storage. So for somebody like you who doesn't want to delete her messages, uh, it's probably a better choice. But it comes with your AT&T, so you might as well keep using it. That's what they I use. Gmail also. My son is always nagging me saying it's so much better and showing me how great it is. Yeah, but. so I'm, I'm acting like your son now. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Ma, Gmail. It's what all the kids are using. No, absolutely. I, I am a Gmail fan, but I think you're fine, and I think this will fix it, Donna. Okay, great. Thanks. Great to talk to you, Leo. Nice to talk to you. Thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. Sorry you couldn't get on last week. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm slow. I don't work as fast as some of these people. Somebody made a good point, though. What happens when you, if you, if you decided to change Internet service providers, it's tied to your account. You'll lose that Yahoo account. What I you might want to do, and get your son to help you with this, Donna, is uh, open a Gmail account. Gmail will get your mail from Yahoo. You can set it up, just get it, automatically get it. So you start using Gmail and start giving out that Gmail address, or even better, register a domain name that's yours, you know, Donna's, Do, Donna's.com or whatever, whatever you can get, and and have that forward to Gmail. So that way you can move around, or Yahoo, you can move around and you, instead of giving out a Yahoo address or a Gmail address, you don't want to give out an address at somebody else's company. You want it to be your address. You know, I use Leoville because Leo Laporte was gone and Leo was gone. So I have Leoville.com and I have all my mail go there and then I can use a different provider because it just forwards it on. Your son can help you with that. It's easy to do. Hover.com is a great place to do that. Um, that they, that's what they do is one of the things they do is email forwarding. So you set up a, I don't know what you want to call it. You could have it your last name. You could, if you have a business, use your business name. It's a little more professional and it has the real advantage of it's the last email address you'll ever use. You just give that out. You never have to worry about it again. And even if you change internet service providers, you move to Germany, you, you whatever. Ah, thank you, Donna. Uh, coming up, Jay in Hollywood. Uh, he's riding a motorcycle from Los Angeles to South America and wants to know if his iPhone can go with him. I love this idea. Jay's Motorcycle Diaries coming up in just a bit. Jay, I'm jealous. It sounds like fun. Jay's motorcycling from where to where? Uh, Hollywood to Rio for Carnival. But I might, <sighs> if things go well, make it to Terra del Fuego. For <sighs> what fun. I've been to Tierra del Fuego. I was there in February. I didn't motorcycle. I, I took a boat.
Well, that's what my most of my family members have done. <laughs> I have to do things. It different. is beautiful. You're going to have a wonderful time. Your iPhone, is it from AT&T? Yes, I have an AT&T, and it's a 3GS. And I was thinking of either upgrading it, or maybe I should keep this. Eh, what if you lose it? Keep it. Yeah. If You know, the camera's better in the 4S, so if you thought you might be taking pictures. Here's the deal. AT&T iPhone will work fine everywhere in South America. No problem. But. Make sure you contact AT&T for several reasons. One, to tell them you're going to make international calls. Otherwise, they're blocked by default. Two, to get an international calling plan, which will still cost you a pretty penny, but it'll be a little bit better. Three, and this is the most important, you do not want to use data roaming. It could cost tens of thousands of dollars. They have international data plans. It's about a buck a megabyte, which is very expensive, but still much cheaper, much cheaper than using roaming. So, so if you aren't going to buy a data plan, and I would recommend you do this, it's, it's a buck a megabyte a month. So 50 bucks for 50 by, megabytes a month. That's probably enough unless you're doing a lot of uh, emailing or picture sending, that kind of thing. If you want to upload pictures, then you might want more. But make sure you get that. Or turn off data entirely on the iPhone, which makes it pretty much useless. Have a great trip, Jay. Thanks for joining me. Leo Laporte, the tech guy.